Now, as you well know, we live in a world where there are many opinions and ideas, a lot of noise going on about pretty much everything. So many things are competing for our attention all the time. Voices everywhere. Whether it's a a musician with their new sound or their latest album, or a football club with its latest signing, its new manager, its trophy cabinet. Might be political opinions, you know, why you should vote for this party, why you should vote for that party. And they're all trying to get your attention, all trying to, they're shouting at you saying, look at us, look at us, come to us, come to us. All these voices are shouting, I'm the greatest, citing their achievements, the reasons why you should ensure your car with them and not with the rival. Anyone who uses any of the social media platforms will also see that phenomenon there as well. Like me. Validate me. And there's more and more noise around. Look at my success. Look at my beauty. Look at where I am. Look at who I'm with where I am. We live in a world where there's the noisy clamour for attention, to get noticed, to be validated, to assert our products, reliability, to have the most beautiful garden, whatever. And the noise can be deafening, can't it? Relentless. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that that these things are bad inherently. We're, We're kind of used to the world being like this. It's how it works. It's how we get stuff done. We compare the market. We get the best deal. But living in a world where the logic is, undeniably, he who shouts the loudest wins... He who has the most toys, that the way to the the top is by striving and and, and pushing down the rival and, and, and success, climbing the ladder. Living in a world with that kind of logic, there could be a danger that we buy into it just a little too much and start maybe even thinking about the living God in this way. Maybe we're tempted to think that's how he is. He's big and noisy and and powerful and demanding all the time, asserting that he is the wisest and cleverest, most credible, the only powerful God. And it is only the totally devoted, totally committed, extremely zealous disciple who can wisely get to the bottom of the deep mysteries of this God and his ways the wise and the learned, and we must be right, and we must persist with being right. So when we come under pressure, when we get reviled, if our logic is wrong, the temptation will be, well, I've got to justify myself. I've got to get in amongst the clamor. I've got to get myself heard so that people can understand me correctly. Shout down the persecutor. Make the case. Psalm 8 is a song that sets out to kind of reprogram our brains back into the logic of the living God. His way is, as Luther put it, it is not a a theology of glory, of power, of, of elbowing your way to the top, but our God, his way, is a theology of the cross, of laying down your life, of serving in humility. The living God has a wisdom and a logic which is totally unlike ours. Even though he is the mighty creator of the heavens, he has all that power yet uses it so very differently to how you and I would if we had that kind of power. And so... We come back here in line with the logic of heaven. We'll understand our world and ourselves aright. And we need this refreshment. We need this reminder of what reality is actually like to cut through all of that noise. So here we go. The superscript. This one is for the choir master or the director of music. And again, like we looked in Psalm 6, we need to have a big vision in our minds. The choir master is directing an orchestra 
of vast proportions, cosmic proportions even. It is for the director of music, according to Gittith. Well, what is a psalm according to Gittith? Well, there are only two others, according to Gittith, in the, in the uh, Psalter, Psalms 81 and 84. David writes this one, Psalm 8. Asaph writes Psalm 81, and the epically named band the Sons of Korah wrote Psalm 84. So all the three major contributors to the Psalms wrote a Gittith, just one. It's obviously the thing to do. Now, if you were to look at all, the other, all of those psalms together, and we don't really have time to look at them all in detail tonight, there's no doubt that when you look at them, what you see from the outset is that there's some sort of bursting joy in praise to Almighty God. They all seem to state also, one way or another, that our true identity, our true understanding and logic is the way of Jesus, his way. It resets our perspective to see that our true purpose and identity is is not to be speakers, but to be spoken to. Not to be those who give, but those who receive. Those who are comfortable dwelling in in the house of the Lord. That's where we're truly us, where we're truly home, where we're truly as we're meant to be. Receiving at home with the Lord. And the psalmists are all completely overcome with joy. They are outbursts of praise to God for this wonderful truth. So here in Psalm 8, verses 1 to 4, it's as if we're, we're joining David and he's wandered outside on a, a starry night. It, you know, we know he's in the Middle East. It wasn't squalling and throwing water in your face like it is tonight. It was warm. The skies were clear. And perhaps for David, it's a bit of a reality check because he's living in a world where there's all these voices and there's all this noise going on. In Psalm 6, he's been crying out because of all of the suffering that this world of power and assertion is causing. And then in Psalm 7, he's being accused, specifically he's being accused of things he didn't do. And so now he comes aside to consider the true logic, the only voice that matters. And he's staring up into the deep depths of heaven. And with this vision of the boundless night sky before him, he starts to write the psalm. He sees the heavens kind of spread out in their unimaginable size and glory. And he's caught up into creation's own song of praise to almighty God. He's hearing the psalm of creation while ever he's writing this one. He is, if you like, out there on his rooftop taking his seat in the cathedral of creation and the service has begun. And let's be clear, as he looks up at the, the stars and into the heavens, he's not getting vague musings about how all of this tells me that there must be something out there the vague spirituality of the theist, you know, the kind of thing. Now, David here, he understands and personally knows this living God that the stars are singing their praises to. So he begins this eruption of praise by saying that the name, which he knows, the name of our Lord, our Lord, not any Lord, but our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? In all the earth, through, in, under, all that is made. Your name, O Lord, is majestic. That is who the psalm of creation is about as he stares into the heavens. It's not vague. It's not general. It is about our Lord and his majestic name. Because you see, if, if the creation only revealed a few vague truths about a mighty creator which could just as well be Allah or the earth mother is creation a heretic why isn't it saying anything that's true or accurate about the Lord God no the heavens declare the word of Christ and we may know his invisible qualities even his divine nature 
These things can be known and seen in what is made, as Romans 1 tells us. The heavens declare the word of Christ. Day to day they pour forth speech about him. Paul quoting in Romans 10, quoting Psalm 19 there. The word of Christ. So, having been in tears and then accused, he goes outside to refresh his soul at the universal praise to the triune God given by all creation. Now, amazing as this is for David, as he gazes at the night sky, in his mind, he knows that there actually is a truth and a glory which is above even the highest heavens. And we're like, what? How's that possible? A truth and a glory which outshines even the wonders of space? Ah, the glory of our Lord has been set above the heavens above the heavens and we're thinking how can anything be greater and and more real and more vital than than the universe but yeah yes we christians can and do and should enjoy and appreciate the beauty and glory of the universe its size its complexity which is beyond our wildest imagination just as david does but The wonder of the Ancient of Days with the Son of Man at his side, that we should have in our minds as even greater and even more real and glorious than even this vast and splendid cosmos that we live in. Now, if our our brains have just about survived verse 1, wait till you see verse 2. If verse 1 is telling us that the Lord God and his glory is set above even the highest heavens, all that is out there and up there praises his name, his name is majestic and glorious, then down here, here below, he's chosen little babies and infants to do the same job for him. He's ordained praise out there from the universe itself. And down here, he selects babies and infants to establish his strength and truth and silence his enemies. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) Surprising? Because we, with our worldly logic of he who shouts the loudest wins and the strong survive and all that, we probably think that we should, you know, why he should give that task to the great preachers, the orators who could talk it all up in, in great prose. But he doesn't. You know, he hasn't ordained praise for himself down here by those who have traveled the world and understand it the best. The great scientists, the philosophers, the, the, the fine artists, the, the top musicians. No, the manifestation of all strength and power, the glory of Jesus and his Father living in the unity of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is reserved by him for babies and toddlers. They're the ones who've been chosen to lead this praise and silence his enemies and speak truth into darkness. It's almost like there's two seemingly incompatible realities here. The vast celestial song, majestic, high and glorious, echoing through all eternity in the vast expanse of heaven. And it's harmonized. It's, it's perfected. It's completed by the simple sound of babies and toddlers. But I'd suggest that he does this Because that best reflects his character and his wisdom, his humility, and his massive grace, his condescending love towards us, these little creatures he's created. Having the babies and infants sing praise alongside the stars and planets, that perfectly displays that peculiar glory that Luther coined a theology of the cross. His cruciform glory. The great and mighty ruler of heaven, unimaginable in his beauty, unapproachable in his holiness. He is so mighty and high and powerful. He's above even everything you can see. And yet, he he comes near. 
He draws near to us. He's humble and gentle and comes even for the very smallest and weakest of us. The lion with all its strength and mighty roar is also a lamb. He's totally approachable. Do you see? Jesus says, come, come to me. Who? The strong? No, the weary, the heavy laden. Come to me and I'll give you rest. And he says to the little children, come to me. That's just how he is. So when we look up into the heavens and we see these stars, we know that our God is not distant like those stars. He's come near and joined us. This is such deep wisdom, isn't it? It's beauty. For those of us like David who know and love the Lord and his way, this way of beauty, it's refreshing, it's sweet logic, it's real, it's firm. But to God's enemies, those who strive on wisdom, power and strength, advancement and achievement, this is ridiculous. That, you know, we, the mighty, we, the wise, we, the educated, the influential, we should be the ones who shout the loudest. <laughs> this kind of truth just annoys and irritates the wise and learned. But the living God of the Bible has ordained that the very smallest and simplest of people, little children, They can truly praise him. They are best placed to grasp the greatness of our God and respond appropriately. Now in Matthew chapter 21, verse 2, we see this in action. We see the reality of this right there. Jesus is entering Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday. It's verses 10 to to 16 of Matthew uh, 21, uh, page 826 if you're following in the Pew Bibles. So he's he's riding into Jerusalem on on a humble donkey's colt. There's humility again. You know, he's not going on a chariot or in a Bugatti Chiron. It's a smelly little donkey. And a load of people are following after him, shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And everyone in Jerusalem's like, well, who's he? And they're like, oh, he's the prophet Nazareth from, from, uh, from prophet Jesus from Nazareth. And he goes into the temple, he turns over the tables, he cleanses the temple, the blind and the lame, they come to him and he heals them. Again, it's the weak who come to him, he heals them. And then verse 15, Matthew 21. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, (laughs) they saw, it's wonderful, but yet they still, you know, they saw the wonderful things they did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. And they said to Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, yeah, I hear it. You never read Psalm 8. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Never read Psalm 8? The whole creation worships me. In fact, it's been ordained that these little children would do this very thing. Have you not read it? The Pharisees and scribes, with all their learning and their religious expertise, were utterly blind to the glory of Christ, the brightness of his glory that outshines the sun. He's right there, yet they can't see him. And they can't see his way. But the toddlers could see him. They got it. They were shouting out his praise in the temple, his temple. And Luke, uh, Luke, he gives an extra detail in Luke 19, verse 40. And, uh, you know, it's the same situation. The, the Pharisees hear the people saying, you know, all this stuff about Jesus. And he says, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're talking about you as if you're God. And Jesus said, well, you know, if the children didn't bring praise... Then even these stones would cry out. The creation, you know? There will be praise. It's been ordained. So Jesus refers them to Psalm 8. In the, right there. To explain why. Why they are silent and not praising, participating 
in the praise of the Son of Man. It's been ordained that these little children would do this to silence you lot, the enemies of God. So we need to be warned, don't we? So it's a warning right there. If Jesus doesn't fit in our theological system, if this logic isn't logic that satisfies us, then we're God's enemy. Jesus the Lord, the Son of Man, is the one who the whole creation praises. And his glory is above even the universe. So if we've got no room for Christ... I mean, that's just messed up, isn't it? If we've got no room for Christ in a world which is his world, made by him, that praises him, then, well, we're out of place. And we should expect the judgment and condemnation that that deserves. Well, David is overcome at these thoughts. Verses 3 and 4. He's full of, of awe at the glory of Christ that overshadows even the inconceivable heavens and yet chooses dependent little infants to lead the chorus of praise on earth and then in verse 3 he takes us really really deep into this profound wisdom of God's truth and there's no more clear place that we can see this logic and wisdom of God the extraordinary union of glory and humility than in the incarnation and in the the cross resurrection and ascension of the son of man so in verse 3 David's thoughts are drifting again to the cosmos here and he's like wow it's just his fingers pushing planets and things around just a little bit of him and he's that majestic he can do that But then in verse 4, he he takes us further into this bottomless wisdom, this divine wisdom centered on the Son of Man. And we do need to have the Son of Man in mind here when we're reading from verse 4. The Son of Man, the one to whom the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 has commissioned and given all dominion and glory and power and authority, not humanity in general. There are some translation issues here, which is why I'm saying that. And uh, if we could have the verses come up on the screen from the ESV, um, John, that would be really helpful. And I'll, I'll talk, talk you through them. Just look at the screen uh, when, we, when we have those verses come up. Now, I think, I think in one sense, when we read this psalm, uh, we, we get a sense, actually, that it, is it really about us, man in general? Everything we've seen so far, I think, sort of pushes against that. And then we read down to verse 6, for example. I don't think David can have humanity in general, Adam, in mind here, because all things are not under our feet, are they? There's no way that we could be like David and go out onto our roofs and stare into the, to the deep heaven and go, yeah asteroids planets galaxies yeah i've got dominion over all of that it's under my feet as a man i don't think he's doing that but when we look at the new testament we do look at the new testament as well we've seen it in the psalm here but in the new testament it's referenced at least four times and each time it places christ as the primary referent of the psalm the son of man it is about Jesus, the majestic name above all names, the one whose name and glory overshadows even the stars and planets, who has a glory and a name and a place that is higher than all things and is the embodiment of this glorious unity of human simplicity and divine power. The one and only person who could think up that little babies would be the ideally placed people to lead the worship. We've already seen that that's how Jesus understands and uses the psalm when he quotes it to the Pharisees on Palm Sunday. But in Hebrews 2, there's quite a a lengthy exposition of the psalm. So let's turn to that now. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 to 9. Hopefully, if it can come up on the screen, that would be helpful. If not, don't worry. But it's page 1001 if you're in the Pew Bibles. Hebrews 2, 6 to 9. 
Thank you. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking, but it has been testified somewhere. I like it. You know, he's just forgotten his Bible reference briefly. It says it somewhere. Oh, it's Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So maybe we're thinking, okay, it could be human, mankind and the Son of Man in comparison. So this is what he's dealing with. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So the writer to the Hebrews is testing that out. Is it about humanity or is it about Jesus? Well, we see Jesus. That's what we see. All things in subjection to him. The making him a little lower than the angels bit. Psalm 8 verse 5 Well, it's Jesus in his incarnation. The the crowning glory, the being crowned with glory and honor bit. Well, that's about the cross. That's where he wins the great crown. And then the rest of the, the chapter from verse 10, he's making the point that actually it is right that the one for whom we exist should be made the founder of salvation through his suffering and death. Because that's like how his logic and wisdom works. What about Paul? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, and also in Ephesians 1, but we'll just look at 1 Corinthians 15. He quotes the psalm, again, speaking about Christ, not humanity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 26 and 27, 961, page 961 of the Pew Bibles. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. You'll see it there, it's in quotes, it's quoting the psalm. Uh, And Paul is saying that even death, death, which we definitely do not have dominion over, death has now been put under the feet of Jesus because of his resurrection. So, David, in Psalm 8, is taking us deep into this wonderful truth, the most glorious truth under heaven, the only truth that really makes sense of us and the universe, the glorious person of Jesus, the Son of Man, who is simultaneously tremendous and terrifying in his power, pushing planets around with his fingertips, but yet reveals his glory, comes to us as a humble servant, taking flesh, made a little while lower than the angels, one that babies would praise. He becomes an infant himself, dependent, a refugee, low. He's mocked, he's spat at, he's despised, he's cursed at, he's tortured, whipped, cruelly killed, And then cursed by heaven. And this is why he's crowned with glory and honor. That's why. He dies a humiliating, dreadful death for his bride. And then rises again from death. Putting every enemy of man under his feet. You want to be with this guy, right? That's who you want. This is what David, this is singing praise to him. You want to be with this guy. He did this for the church. He did this. It's wonderful. No wonder the psalm finishes the way it does in verse 9. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So in the New Testament, there is no suggestion at all that David is referring to all humanity in general. Sadly, a number of uh, modern translations, including the popular 2011 NIV, due to a 
I'd suggest an overzealous commitment to a gender-neutral translation philosophy. They've literally neutered the psalm. They've taken away the glorious truth that, that David, Paul, the Hebrews are singing about. Jesus. Those translations that have it as human beings, humanity in general, are making a Christ-focused reading of this psalm impossible, even though that's the new, how the New Testament is saying we should read it. And they even remove the divine title, Son of Man, which is shameful. It is not about how awesome we are as creatures in his creation. The point of the psalm, the reason for David's explosion of praise to the living God as he contemplates the sermon of creation, it's the majestic Lord, the Son of Man, whose glory is set above the heavens, who then becomes flesh at Christmas and dies at Easter to receive his crown. He has risen to the highest place to receive a name and a glory, the name above all names, Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow, all things in subjection to him and him alone. Well, I love the way that David ends the psalm. I've always loved this. Because we might initially think that, you know, there's a little checklist going on here from verse 7 of some of the things that are under the feet of Jesus. And we might think it's a little bit mundane. Everything is under the feet and in subjection to the glorious Son of Man whom the Ancient of Days has given authority to. Well, even the sheep and the cattle. Yeah, even that. And we might think, oh, come on, Dave, think bigger. Think of, like, the rulers and authorities from the unseen creation. Think about galaxies again. You're good at that. No. Actually, these are the things that David really understands. This is his world, isn't it? He was a shepherd. When, when the prophet came to select the next king, they went through all of those big, strong boys. Where's the other one? Oh, there's the little kid out in the field tending the sheep. Yeah, he's the one. That's the wisdom and logic of God. That's the world and background and understanding of David. My whole world under the feet of Jesus. Everything. Having thought about his glorious Lord the majesty of his name, the way he's ordained praise from heaven and from children, the way he came to take his crown, incarnation and crucifixion. When we think of the man, the true man, the son of man, and his way and logic, yeah, we burst out into praise. And it brings our whole lives and minds and hearts aligned with heaven. To enjoy everything the way that God has intended it to be enjoyed. We understand our humanity better than everything. Now, this is why I think David is content in Psalm 7 to a leave vindication to the Lord. I don't care what my enemies say about me. I care what he says about me because he's got a name above all names. He's got a glory that's set above it. I don't mind what they say. Whatever. Who are they? Him. That's what matters. So in all our quests to find meaning, identity, personhood, and establish ourselves in this world, to find a judgment of us that is really satisfying we need to have this kind of logic to be looking in the right place amidst the noise and the clamor that's constantly going on all of the theology of power and success and elbowing your way to the top it's good for us to be refreshed in this way the song of creation silencing all of that noise but here's the thing did you know that if you're in Christ, 
you share this place with him. The song of creation, the glory of Jesus set above the heavens. If you're in Christ, you enjoy every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You get to receive a name. And you know that that name is above all names because you are called Christian. You receive that name and it becomes yours. And you receive a crown from Jesus, a crown that is yours. You didn't win it for yourself. He won it for you. You know how he won it. Sacrifice, death, suffering, humility, and service. And you get to share that crown and glory with your king. You get to call the father your father. You get to enjoy the indwelling presence of his spirit within you. So that in Christ we can now understand this psalm as saying something about us. In Christ. Not in Adam, but in the Son of Man. Why does God bother with humanity? Well, Jesus became one of us. And you can become one with Jesus. If you're a Christian, you are one with Jesus. So we go from the endless struggle of striving and and battling to justify ourselves, to get to the top, having everything. No, we, in Christ and through Christ, we get to reign with him from the highest heaven. And we will join with him and the angels in judging the creation in the world to come. We are his bride. We are the jewel of his perfection. And in Christ, we have nothing to fear. No condemnation of David and his enemies. No, no condemnation. Nothing to fear. No accusation. No enemies. Because they all lie crushed beneath his pierced feet. And we stand with him. I want to stand with him. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.